I welcome you to Francois's next lecture. Revelation 8 tells us about seven trumpets. It is with good reason that Jesus uses trumpets as symbols. The messages of Revelation 8 must be proclaimed loudly like the sound of a trumpet. In this presentation, Francois will deal with the first four trumpets. He will continue now. In our previous lecture, we studied about the seven churches and the seven seals. We've discovered that the starting point was the Christian era and the grand climax will be the glorious second coming of Christ. We've also discovered that these visions begin with a sanctuary scene. Before writing to the seven churches, John saw Jesus amidst the candlesticks. And before telling us about the seven seals, he sees the table of presence or showbread in the sanctuary. These visions are all Christ-centered. And now I want to ask you a question. Can we expect the same chronology, sequence of events in the vision of the seven trumpets? Can we expect the seven trumpets to start during the time of Christ's first coming to the earth and ending at his second coming? Most definitely. Before telling us about the seventh seal, which deals with the second coming of Christ, John asks us a question. He says in Revelation 6.17, For the great day of his wrath has come, and who shall be able to stand? Will you, will I? Well, only if we part of the sealed 144,000. Revelation chapter 7 verse 4, Then I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 from all the tribes of Israel. Only these people will be ready to meet Jesus when he comes again. What is this seal? In our previous study, we discovered that the seal of God is contained in the fourth commandment. This is the only place in scripture where the three characteristics of a seal are found. God's title, his name and his territory. But to receive the seal of the living God is more than just keeping God's holy Sabbath. Revelation 14.1 says, Then I looked, and there before me was the Lamb, standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. Name and character are synonymous. The symbolic 144,000, 12 times 12 times 1,000, who will be saved when Jesus comes, will not only keep his Sabbath holy, they will also reflect the character of their Creator and their Recreator. Let's read the exciting account of the trumpets. Revelation 8 verse 2 says, And I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. In the right-hand corner, you're looking at the relief of two trumpets that were taken from the Temple of Jerusalem when the Romans captured the city in 70 AD. Let's ask Numbers 10 verse 9 to help us unlock the meaning of the word trumpet. When you go into battle in your own land against an enemy who is oppressing you, sound a blast on the trumpet. Then you will be remembered by the Lord your God and rescued from your enemies. So let's keep this in mind as we decode Revelation's trumpets. They are warning people of coming judgments. In 1 Corinthians 14.8, Paul says, If the trumpet does not sound a clear call, who will get ready for the battle? But there is another very important dimension. Ten days before the great day of atonement, the priests had to blow their trumpets to remind Israel of the approach of the solemn day. And in our study of Daniel 7 and 8, we discovered that this was also a day of judgment. So in our study of the seven trumpets, we must also look for the beautiful but solemn truth of Jesus in the Most Holy. Fortunately, he is not only our judge, he is also our advocate. When did he begin his work in the Most Holy? 1844. Let's read from Revelation chapter 8 verses 3 and 4. Another angel, who had a golden censer, came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense to offer, with the prayers of all the saints, on the golden altar before the throne. The smoke of the incense, together with the prayers of all the saints, went up before God from the angel's hand. 
I'm so thankful that my stammering, faulting, selfish prayers ascend with a sweet-smelling fragrance of Christ's merits to the Father. When you and I pray, Christ adds his merits to our imperfect prayers and convinces the universe that it is all right for God to listen to our petitions. But besides presenting our prayers to God, John sees something else, something very strange. But before reading it to you, I want to say something very important. The book of Revelation is written in the language of the Old Testament and in order to understand it, we must ask the Old Testament to interpret the different symbols. Revelation 8 verse 5 Then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, and hurled it onto the earth. And there came peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. You're looking at a satellite picture of our planet. God loves the people who live here. And he wants every one of us to be saved. How does he go about accomplishing his noble goal for my life? Well, he sent Jesus to this planet to convince me of his love. Romans 2 verse 4 says, God's kindness leads you to repentance. But if these milder measures fail, does he give up on us? No. He allows me to reap what I've sown. And then? Does he leave me in the mess I've landed myself into? No, he continues to call me to repentance. The messages of the seven trumpets are messages calling us to repentance. God is using every kind of appeal, every type of imagery to warn us of the coming doom. Actually, he is shouting at us, saying, watch out. And if we should persist in our sinful ways, we will be lost forever. Let's ask John to tell us about the work of the seven angels. Revelation 8, 6 and 7 says... Then the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared to sound them. The first angel sounded his trumpet, and there came hail and fire mixed with blood, and it was hurled upon the earth. Now listen to the effect the hail and fire with blood had on this planet. It says, A third of the earth was burnt up, a third of the trees were burnt up, and all the green grass was burnt up. Now for the decoding of the first trumpet. When you look at the use of hail, fire and blood taken together in the Old Testament, they depict war. Trees and green grass refer to a certain kind of people as we shall see in a minute. But what about the use of the word third? The prophecy says that a third of the trees and of the grass would be burnt up. Well, it indicates significant military activity but certainly not global annihilation. While we're looking at the ruins of ancient Corinth, we must ask ourselves the next question. Where can we expect the judgment of God to begin? With the wicked or with God's people? Is there a biblical principle to guide us? Yes, there is. This is what 1 Peter 4.17 says. For it is time for judgment to begin with the family of God. And if it begins with us, What will the outcome be for those who do not obey the gospel of God? Question. Did a major judgment, disaster, strike the people of God in the first century? Yes. It was the terrible destruction of the Jewish nation and the fall of its capital city, Jerusalem, in AD 70. Why? Because they rejected the one who came to be their protector. As we saw earlier, the fire, blood and hail, which represent warfare, destroy vegetation. And now we want to know the meaning of green grass and trees. Isaiah 44 verses 3 and 4 I will pour out my spirit on your offspring and my blessing on your descendants. They will spring up like grass in the meadow, like poplar trees by flowing streams. But the best interpretation of the meaning of green vegetation comes from Jesus himself when a group of people followed him to Calvary. Luke 23 verse 31 For if men do these things when the tree is green, what will happen when it is dry? It's a very sad story. The Jewish nation rejected their Messiah 
and they lost their shield. And this is the warning message of the first trumpet. Learn from the calamities that befell the Jews. If they had listened to the teachings of Jesus and heeded the prophecies of Daniel, the Romans would not have destroyed them and their beautiful temple. The New Testament history tells us that many individual Jews learned a lesson from this trumpet warning and became Christians after the destruction of Jerusalem. Just a final word on the use of the term third. In this prophetic context, it represents some specific entity such as a nation and its capital, for instance, Judea and Jerusalem, or a religion like Judaism and its principal center of worship, also Jerusalem. Let me give you a short preview of the meaning of the seven trumpets and then we'll study them one by one. And as we do so, you will see the harmony between them and the seven seals and the seven churches. The first trumpet symbolizes the divine judgments that came upon Jerusalem and the Jewish nation when they set themselves against Christ and his followers. You're looking at the ruins of the ancient forum from where the world was ruled for so many centuries. The second trumpet symbolizes judgments upon the Western Roman world because of their persecution of God's people. The third divine judgment fell upon the professed Church of Christ when it allowed itself to become defiled by Satan and sent forth streams of death rather than life. The fourth divine judgment was the ensuing darkness of the Middle Ages. This trumpet corresponds with the fourth seal, the black horse. The fifth was the Mohammedan scourges that swept over the Middle East and into Europe. It's a fascinating story. The sixth divine judgment consists of the scourges that continued under Turkish control of large sections of Asia, Africa and Europe. The seventh divine judgment constitutes the final terrifying outbreak of human passion and hate that characterizes the final period of earth's history prior to the second coming of Christ. Before we study the second trumpet, let's do a quick review of the first. We discovered that hail and fire mixed with blood represented the Roman war against Judea. We also discovered something about one-third of the earth and trees and all the green grass. They represent God's people, still in the Old Testament sense of the Jewish nation and their capital city, Jerusalem, which the Romans destroyed in AD 70. And we also looked at the biblical principle which says that God begins his punishment with his own people. Revelation chapter 8 verses 8 and 9. The second angel sounded his trumpet and something like a huge mountain, all ablaze, was thrown into the sea. A third of the sea turned into blood, a third of the living creatures in the sea died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. What is the meaning of this huge mountain all ablaze? It took quite some effort to climb this specific mountain. In AD 79, it was all ablaze. Do you recognize him? It's Vesuvius. The black stuff that you see is solidified lava. But if you were here when Vesuvius erupted, you would have seen streams of fire coming down this mountain. Can the Bible explain the meaning of a symbolic mountain all ablaze? Yes, it can. While you're looking at the burnt out crater of Vesuvius, I will ask Jeremiah 51 verse 25 to do the interpretation. I'm against you, O destroying mountain, you who destroy the whole earth, declares the Lord. I will stretch out my hand against you, roll you off the cliffs and make you a burned out mountain. Jeremiah 51 verse 24 tells us that this destroying mountain is the kingdom of Babylon. There is no better interpreter of the Bible than the Bible itself. Question. Which destroying mountain, nation, was active during the early Christian era? The huge burning mountain John saw in vision was the mighty Roman Empire. You're looking at the ruins of the Forum in Rome. All the great decisions concerning the persecution of God's people were made right here. 
Although the Roman Empire was initially used by God to punish the Jewish nation for its guilt and sins, its hostility towards Christ and his people called for its ultimate downfall. Revelation chapter 8 verse 8 says, The mountain was thrown into the sea. Now who or what represents the sea? Revelation 17.15 Then the angel said to me, The waters you saw, where the prostitute sits, are people, multitudes, nations and languages. There is a marvellous harmony between the prophetic books of Daniel and Revelation. Daniel chapter 2 tells us that the Roman Empire would break up into ten kingdoms. Revelation 8 verse 8 tells us that it would sink beneath the waves of a sea of nations. In 455 AD, when the Vandals ransacked Rome, they in turn stole the golden lampstand which the Romans stole from Jerusalem. Revelation chapter 8 verses 10 and 11. The third angel sounded his trumpet and a great star blazing like a torch fell from the sky on a third of the rivers and on the springs of water. The name of the star is Wormwood. A third of the waters turned bitter and many people died from the waters that had become bitter. You are looking at a picture of Halley's Comet. While in vision, John saw a heavenly object called Wormwood. Who is this bitter and poisonous star that fell from heaven? In Luke chapter 10 verse 18, Jesus says, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. The same event of the casting out of Satan is also mentioned in Revelation 12 verse 9. This is the oasis called Mara in the Sinai Desert. When the children of Israel tasted the water, it was bitter. Revelation 8.11 says that when a star called Wormwood fell on the rivers and springs of water, the water turned bitter. You're looking at water gushing from a well at Engedi in the Judean desert. What is the spiritual meaning of rivers and springs of water? Revelation chapter 21 verse 6 has this to say, To him who is thirsty, I will give to drink without cost from the spring of the water of life. If you have not quenched your spiritual thirst with the waters of life, I would encourage you to do so. It satisfies like nothing else does. In John chapter 7 verse 37, Jesus compares himself to water. If any man is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Satan, called Wormwood, promulgated his false teachings through his false teachers, and the pure water of biblical doctrines became polluted and poisonous. There is only one being that fits the description of Wormwood, and that is Satan. In our previous lectures, we discussed all the false doctrines that crept into the church when it compromised with the world. They sacrificed the pure water of the gospel for the bitter water of false doctrine. I trust that you are still with me. It's very important to let the Bible interpret itself. Let's do a quick review. Wormwood, the blazing falling star, represents Satan and the Christian teachers who served his purposes. A third of the rivers and fountains, the true religion of Christ and the truth about him entrusted to the Christian Church of the Middle Ages, especially as centered in the Church of Rome and polluted by Wormwood error. Revelation chapter 8 verse 12, the fourth angel sounded his trumpet and a third of the sun was struck, a third of the moon and a third of the stars, so that a third of them turned dark. A third of the day was without light, and also a third of the night. In the lecture of the seven seals, we studied the characteristics of the four horses. We discovered that during the period of the black horse, the third seal, the light of the gospel was terribly obscured. But during the period of the pale horse, the fourth seal, truth was almost totally obliterated, Christ, the Son of Righteousness, as Malachi 4 verse 2 calls him, was eclipsed by the veneration of saints and popes. 
This period stretches from 538 to 1563 AD. It's the period of the greatest spiritual darkness in the history of mankind. Why? People rejected the light. When Jesus taught in the temple and in the synagogues, he repeatedly called himself the light of the world. In a previous study of Daniel 8, we saw how the little horn, pagan and papal Rome, took away the daily, the tamid, the beautiful, bright shining message of Christ our High Priest. In 1054, for instance, the papacy angrily excommunicated the Greek Orthodox Church with its millions of members. Why? Because they insisted, amongst other things, to observe the Sabbath, the seventh day of the week, God's holy day of rest. John saw that the light shining from Christ would be dimmed, and it happened. And in the second, invading tribes devastate the Roman Empire. The cruel mountain is set ablaze and it disappears. When you have a closer look at the messages of the first two trumpets, you discover that they make a pair. In the first, the Roman Empire devastates the Jewish nation. And in the second, the invading tribes devastate the Roman Empire. The cruel mountain is set ablaze and it disappears. The third and the fourth trumpets also make a pair. In the third, error pollutes Christ's church on earth. A third of the light of the heavenly bodies? In other words, the priestly ministry of Jesus, the Son of Righteousness, the light of the world, centered in the heavenly sanctuary, was obscured by a new false churchly priesthood. In the fourth, error further obscures Christ's work in heaven. So far for the first four trumpets. Did you learn any lessons from these warnings? The lesson I learned is that obedience to God averts spiritual calamities and brings inner peace. Revelation 8.13 As I watched, I heard an eagle that was flying in mid-air call out in a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth because of the trumpet blasts about to be sounded by the other three angels. I think we've done enough hard thinking for the time being. In our next lecture, we are going to look at the three woes, the three terrible calamities that will strike the planet. The first of these woes, Luther identified as Mohammedan scourges that swept over the Middle East and Europe. The advancing Mohammedan armies were only stopped at the Battle of Tours in 732 AD. Europe could have been Muslim if it wasn't for this specific victory. When you read the Quran, you will come to a passage which encourages Muslims to participate in holy wars. They call it the Jihad. I'm quoting from page 104 from the Quran. It says, Allah loves those who fight for his cause. He will lodge you in pleasant mansions in the Garden of Eden. That is supreme triumph. Whenever you travel in a Muslim country, you will find a mosque. And five times a day, a prayer ascend to Allah over the loudspeakers. There is no God but Allah, and Muhammad is his prophet. Because of their theology, many bloody wars have been fought and will still be fought. Don't miss the next lecture on Islam, the first woe, and listen to what prophecy tells us about them. The second woe, or the sixth trumpet, concerns the Ottoman Turks. For many centuries the world feared these valiant fighters who invented gunpowder. I've been to some of the museums in Istanbul where you can see their past glory on display. Let me quickly take you in here and show you just one of the beautiful items in the Dolmabachi. The Prophet John saw the sultans who drank from these gold cups in vision on the Isle of Patmos. Please don't miss the next lecture. Many thoughts went through my mind as I sailed on the Bosphorus and visited ancient Constantinople Sultanahmet, today called Istanbul. Whenever I listen to God's word, I prosper spiritually. But whenever I ignore his word, 
darkness settles in. And as I watch the sun on the Bosphorus go down, I ask the Lord to please make me lovingly obedient. Before telling us about the third woe, the last one, John sees a mighty angel in vision. He has an open book in his hand. And as we will be studying chapter 10, we will discover that this open book is the prophetic book of Daniel and specific mention is made of chapters 8 and 9. We will also discover that the termination of the second woe or sixth trumpet ends in 1844. Please read this fascinating chapter in the meantime and see if you can discover who this mighty angel is. In chapter 11, we are going to look at the indifferent way the Bible was treated throughout the ages and you will also listen to the shocking account of how the National Assembly of France decided to ban Holy Scriptures. For the first time in the book of Revelation, we are going to hear of the 1,260 years of which we've studied in Daniel chapter 7. The third woe occurs just before the second coming of Christ. What a blessed climax! Beyond the clouds of persecution and trials, there awaits us a land of eternal bliss. Please don't disappoint yourself and be lost on that day. But more than that, please don't disappoint Jesus who died for you and has prepared a place for you in his eternal kingdom. Just a last thought to conclude the first part of the seven trumpets. One Friday afternoon at three o'clock, a priest sacrificed the lamb for the evening sacrifice. He blew on his shofar, his trumpet, to let the Jewish nation know that the sacrifice was completed. Not far from there, another sacrifice was brought for the sins of the world. And as the sounds of the ancient shofar died away, Christ died on Calvary. The sound of that trumpet announced to the world that the greatest sacrifice was complete. The sound of that trumpet assured the sound of the last trumpet when Jesus would come in all his glory. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 51 to 53 Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a flash in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet shall sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we will be changed. For this perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality. Thank you, Francois. We can learn a lot from the mistakes made by our predecessors. God does not want us to make the same mistakes. He advises us to learn from the past. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, please help us to realize the seriousness of Revelation 8. Give us the willingness to follow your advice and prepare for the day the last trumpet will sound. In Jesus' name, Amen.